Our guest on This is America and the World is David Ignatius. David's the award-winning foreign affairs columnist for the Washington Post and formerly served as executive editor of the International Herald Tribune. Long ago, he was a former reporter with the Wall Street Journal. David, so great to be with you once again. Great to be back. Thank you, Dennis. When you look at the world today, what do you see? Well, I see a terrible war in Ukraine that's really the most dangerous conflict of my lifetime. I was alive during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. I remember my dad, who worked for the government, disappearing in a way that scared the heck out of me. But in this case, there's a war going on as there's a threat by Russia to use nuclear weapons. So it's a, it's a, it's a dangerous period. I, I see China rising. Uh, China uh, eager, it seems, to, to take control of Taiwan in a way that could also lead to war. Uh, I see in America struggling to hold itself together mm -hmm. for the first time. Really, uh, I feel our democracy is under threat. I hope we stand together and overcome those threats. But it's it's time when, when there's some big, dangerous storm clouds on the horizon. Not just on the horizon, they're right on top of us. Right. Um, winter is coming to Europe, and uh, energy, plants are shutting down, people are going to get cold. How is that all going to work out as far as the war continuing, and Russia and NATO, and the EU sticking together? So uh, President Vladimir Putin of Russia is betting that the West's resolve will crack. Mm. That's a simple description of, of what his game is. He, uh, this week is annexing the territories the Russian army has been uh, occupying, has not yet controlled in Ukraine, just seizing Ukrainian territory after a, f a fake referendum. And he's betting that through this cold winter, as Europeans shiver, and they'll begin to feel that this isn't worth it. Yeah, mm -hmm. Oh, what the heck, you know, let's, let's let Putin have his, his territory in Ukraine. And I just hope that's a bad bet. I, I think this is one time when the strongest weapon that the West has isn't our weapons, it's our patience. Mm. It's, our, it's our toughness. Putin's bet is that the West is basically weak and lacks that, that toughness, that inner toughness to see, see things through. Uh, if he's right, uh, Ukraine is gone. Now, all that terrible suffering in Ukraine we've seen on television will have been for, for I don't want to say nothing, but for very little. Uh, if, if, we're, if, we're, if we're tough, if we hold together, if we support our political leadership, I think Putin's going to lose big. I think mm. Putin's playing the weakest hand imaginable. He's just counting on our lack of resolve. We hear and read in the papers uh, 100,000 possible deaths for the Russian soldiers. We never hear of numbers vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. Anything you know that you can share? Well, I, I think Ukrainian deaths have been uh, on the order of Russian deaths. It's wow. hard to compare. I, I think that 100,000 de dead figure may be a little higher than okay. what, I've, what I've heard estimated, but it, tens of thousands have died on both sides. This has been a war, again, unlike anything we've seen uh, in my lifetime. It's, it's, it is a, like World War II. It's a, it's a slugfest on the ground, the, the most vicious weapons, bombardment of civilian areas, so uh, it's a terrible cost. I think it's been a surprise to all of us, Dennis, how badly the Russian army has performed. Mm -hmm. That's the real the shock of this war is how incompetent they are. How do you think uh, President Biden has handled things? I think he's done pretty well, to be honest. It's a tricky line. He's, 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 he's walking a very delicate tightrope, isn't he? He is. It is a tightrope. So he, he basically has said, we're going to do everything we can to support Ukraine's attempt to protect itself, to repel the invaders, to stop this illegal seizure of territory. But we do not want a war between the United States and Russia. So he's observing limits on what we will give to Ukraine, mm -hmm. even as he tries to support them strongly. I basically think that's the right policy. I, I think that uh, we, we need to, this Russia is a nuclear superpower. Putin said last week, uh, he warned that he would use all weapons available, including mm -hmm. nukes, mm -hmm. and said, I'm not bluffing. This is not a bluff. When, when a foreign leader says that with nuclear weapons, you have to take it seriously. I think Biden has, and I think that's appropriate. Can you take that, and I had written that phrase down, it's not a bluff. Can you take that two ways, 
Is there a need for a leader to have to say that? Well, the way you become credible in, in your nuclear uh, diplomacy, <laughs> nuclear threats, is by making people think you'd actually do that crazy uh, thing. You would use those weapons. So the, the Nixon it was said, President Nixon wanted the idea that he was a madman. He was a strategic madman, that he'd actually, he'd actually do it. Uh, Donald Trump used to like to play on that, on that idea. He's the guy who might actually launch that nuke on Korea, North Korea's Kim Jong-un. So uh, I, I think Putin's trying to make his power credible. I, as I talk to people in the U.S. government, they say that they, say that they see no signs of actual mobilization. Mm -hmm. they, they can observe when weapons are moved, when yes. the alert status has changed, all the precursors. Uh, for actual use of nuclear weapons. They haven't seen yet, but that doesn't mean that they won't be coming. When you uh, become aware that uh, President Xi has kind of turned against uh, Putin, uh, Prime Minister Modi has turned against, uh, protests now in Russia, we're now reading these letters from Russian soldiers from the front. Is Putin backed into a corner? I think he is backed into a corner. I think his recent actions are acts of desperation. Mm -hmm. His army is crumbling on the front. The breakthrough that the Ukrainians made in Kharkiv in the east uh, over the last month was stunning. Uh, Putin is struggling to keep his army intact. Uh, I'm told there's you know, bitter dissension among his military and security subordinates in Moscow about who's to blame for all this. So I, I don't think we should, we should see this as a strong Putin, but a weak, a weak Putin. And again, I think time actually works in our favor if we can be patient. It's like, it's like the Cold War. The rot in the Russian system is so deep that if we're patient, that system uh -huh. is going to crumble. If uh, he's threatening the use of strategic nuclear weapons, what would one be? What, 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 what comes to your mind if he followed through on that? So, Dennis, I think it's right to say that he's threatening the use of tactical nuclear tactical. weapons, which, which are the more limited ones. So, Tactical different than strategic? So tactical okay. uh, nuclear weapons, supposedly, are battlefield nuclear weapons. So you have the Ukrainian army, let's say, uh, surging towards um, Kherson, which is a key mm -hmm. strategic town, mm -hmm. uh, almost on the Black Sea. They're about to make another breakthrough. So uh, Putin decides, I've got to stop that advancing army. So he, he would use, it's theorized, a tactical nuclear weapon, which would uh, be so strong that it would stop the army's advance. But the Russians say that they've developed uh, tactical nuclear weapons that have very low yield, that don't do enormous damage to civilians, that have very limited fallout uh, uh, spread, uh, and so can actually be used on a, on a modern battlefield. I think the American view is um, any move into the nuclear space is unacceptable. I don't think the U.S. would respond with nuclear weapons. I think there's been a lot of discussion about that, and that's not the way we would go. But we've... How would we go? So we, our military has worked for a generation to develop conventional weapons that are so powerful that if there was use of a, of a tactical nuclear, nuclear weapon, we could respond without going nuclear ourselves to keep from getting on that ladder of escalation where you go all the way up to you know, total nuclear war. So we don't want to do that. Would so, we have to go in or above Ukraine itself? So my ex expectation, but what do I know, is that, is that this would be a joint NATO operation in support of Ukraine. If Ukraine was attacked with tactical, tactical nuclear, nuclear weapons, we'd use air power, we'd use missiles. But the Russian force that's in Ukraine would be highly vulnerable. Our, our national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, said last weekend it would be catastrophic for that force. So what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the idea is make Putin guess about that, make him worry. Tough times, huh? Yeah. Woo. Take a little break. Back on the other side with David Ignatius from the Washington Post. Sit tight. This is America and the World. This is America and the World is made possible by the Japan America Society of Washington, D.C., the Republic of Uzbekistan, the Sultanate of Oman, the Kingdom of Morocco, 
21st Century Citizenship, the Frank Islam and Debbie Dreisman Foundation, the Forerunner Foundation, the Rotondaro Family Trust, and the Embassy Series, Uniting People Through Musical Diplomacy. Hungary, uh, Sweden, Italy, Poland, moving to the right. What do you see in Europe? I do see a growing populist movement in each of the countries that you mentioned. I worry about that. I see the same thing in the United States. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we elected Donald Trump in 2016 on a similar nationalist, uh, populist agenda. It's something that's, that's loose in the world. There are a lot of people who just feel that they were left out mm -hmm. of globalization, that uh, some people got all the goodies and they didn't. And so there's that anger uh, wherever you look. Ang part of the anger is directed towards uh, migrants uh, in mm -hmm. these European countries that you mentioned uh, and also in the U.S. At the same time, uh, Dennis, you know, I, I am struck by some positive developments in Europe. Sweden and Finland, uh, after decades of neutrality, have joined NATO. Mm -hmm. They are part of this alliance that's about protecting the freedom of Europe and the United States. It's why, in the end, Russia is going to lose this conflict in Ukraine. It doesn't, simply doesn't have the power of these other countries. Russia is now surrounded. Russia has done the thing that, in a sense, Russia feared most, which is to invite mm -hmm. additional pressure. Finland and Sweden challenged Russia in this northern area that's strategically important as the Arctic becomes more navigable, more open. So I, I think there's some underlying trends that are quite positive for the U.S. The, the problem is that our political systems at home here and in Europe are broken. Uh, and that's, that's, I think, what's behind this revolt. If you say the political systems are broken, are you also saying America is broken? I don't think America's broken. Ah. So I think our businesses are as dynamic, oh, basically, as they, as they ever have been. I think the Federal Reserve, despite making some mistakes, is still an overwhelming leader of the global financial system. Uh, you know, I, if, I said to a friend recently, if America was a stock, I'd buy it. And the reason I'd buy it is because I, I still think all the fundamental strengths of our economy, our culture, our, our dynamism are, are, are still there. I do think our political system isn't working. And I think that, that as the political system fails to deliver, people are getting angrier, they're blaming each other. We do have you know, deep cultural differences. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I wonder if we're all living in the same country. <laughs> but, uh, but there are a lot of things ab about America, to be honest, that seem to me as strong as they ever have been. Uh, lots of commentary now, lots of reporting uh, in print, on television, radio, about the threat uh, in our country to our democracy. When, when we throw out the word democracy in our conversation, if I toss it to you, what, what comes to your mind? And, and, and on top of what comes to your mind as far as democracy is concerned, is what, what are we running the risk of losing if we lose our democracy? So democracy to me means the obvious things. It means the ability to say what you think, uh, to uh, worship as you, as you choose, to have privacy, a, a sphere of, of personal life, uh, to be able to vote your leaders in or out. Uh, mm -hmm. If you don't like the way the country's being led, uh, chuck them, get, mm -hmm. get somebody else in. Mm -hmm. But democracy to me also means a kind of collective cohesion. It's not just about personal freedom. It's not just about individualism, the kind of live free or die. It's, it's about cohesion. Mm -hmm. it's, about, it's about governing ourselves together and taking care of each other in our country. Mm -hmm. It's the second part that I think is, is, is in trouble. We are not working well together. Mm -hmm. our, our social solidarity as a country just is beginning to break down. I, I grew up in what people always described as a melting pot. Mm -hmm. We're not really mm -hmm. a melting pot now. We, we kind of insist on being separate or separate of entities. And the reasons for that is just that the, 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 our national cohesion, our ability to operate together requires some things that we share in common, some, some 
basic fundamental beliefs that we have as a democracy. Otherwise, democracy begins to break down. Uh, because so many people are not accepting us as a multicultural society, which we are. We are. We, we are. It's one of our strengths. And so my, my family comes from immigrants, mm -hmm. as, as so many, I dare say, most American families do. America's the place that we, we came, our, our ancestors came and worked hard and, and found a place in this country that was so good. Our genius is, is accepting people and they can feel part of, of a whole, out of, out of many one, that's our mm -hmm. national slogan, mm -hmm. the, the pluribus unum. So we, we have the many, um, we are multicultural, but we need the one too. We need to all figure out what we've got in common. What are you gonna do though with the fact that uh, in the Republican Party, 70% of Republicans are kind of denying or not accepting the results of the election of 2020. I mean, that's, that's, that's almost unbelievable to say out loud and to, to have people accepting it on that level. You know, the honest answer is I'm gonna depend on sensible Republicans to talk their brothers and sisters out of it. I'm gonna ask you a tough question. And, and, and it is a tough one, and I kind of, do you think it's the responsibility of every journalist, such as yourself, in talking with their sources, on the record, off the record, to immediately say, who won the election of 2020? I don't think that reporters have done that. And I think the reason, humbly I say, with respect, that a lot of times they don't ask that question because they are protecting their sources. There, there may be some of that. Uh, you know, I, I've interviewed a lot of people over so many decades whose views I found abhorrent. Yeah. You know, you know I can remember interviewing Yasser Arafat in Beirut, a, a person uh, whose values, whose positions, whose denunciations of Israel I, I thought were appalling. But that didn't mean I didn't inter interview him. That didn't mean I didn't try to do my job as a journalist. I've been in all kinds of war zones and interviewed people, who, again, who I, you know, I would not want to invite to dinner. Um, but so I, I, I don't think that we should have a, a pre-requirement for interviewing people. Hmm. I think when it comes to saying whether somebody's telling the truth or not, it's, it's crucial. You know, when Arafat asserted something about Israel, uh, the, you know, that was false. And then just to, to make that clear, or in the case of somebody who, who claims that uh, Trump won the election in 2020, just say, that's a lie, that's not true. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna talk to him. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that people should be asking a Ted Cruz <laughs> who won the election Absolutely. straight out? Absolutely, I think. And all of those Republicans that you're hoping will eventually show people the light and say, this is where we are. We've got to come so, together. So, you know, Dennis, I, I may be uh, nuts about this. I, I, I <laughs> often fear I, I'm too optimistic to be a journalist. But <laughs> I, have, I have sensed over the last year, six months, that Republicans who were part of Trump's inner circle are finally defecting, are finally saying enough. Mm -hmm. For example, William Barr is attorney general. Mm -hmm. Not somebody whose, whose conduct as Attorney General I thought was, was appropriate uh, during the period of the Mueller report and after. He is now being forthright in saying uh, Trump lies about the election, Trump proposed things that were absolutely unacceptable. Uh, I could go down a list, uh, other people working in the White House, the White House counsel, Pat Cipollone, similarly has, has spoken out about mm -hmm. the things he tried to, to stop. Uh, around the country, I mean, the people who saved us uh, after the election in 2020 were Republican state and mm -hmm. you know, local uh, election officials. They were Republican appointed judges who threw out uh, false uh, lawsuits that were brought. So uh, I, I want to praise those people and mm -hmm. say they're crucial as the guardrails against worse things happening. It does scare the heck out of me that you know, more and more Republican candidates feel they have to swear allegiance to this lie uh, about the election, that's wrong. Uh, but I want to support the Republicans who say, nope, not going to do it. Is that the bright spot that uh, that might be on the horizon? That slowly people are stepping out and saying, I'm not going to support that. Part. 
So I see a few more Republicans uh, deciding I'm not going to play Trump's game. I'm not going to ask for his endorsement. I'm not going. I'm not going to go along with the 2020 election lie. It, it doesn't always work. I, somebody I, I admire a lot, David McCormick, who was running for the Senate nomination in Pennsylvania. Uh, was beaten by Dr. Oz because Dr. Oz said, uh, yes, sir, you know, it was, uh, the election was stolen. And, and David McCormick uh, refused to do that. David McCormick, a, a military veteran, a person of the highest uh, character, in my view, wouldn't do it. And he didn't get the endorsement, and he lost. But I'm hoping, you know, down the line, uh, more people will, will take that risk. And, you know, over time, I mean, over time, everything that becomes unbalanced you know, finally, we just know pendulums do swing back. I don't, I don't know how long it's going to take, but the idea that the Republican Party is going to forever remain out here in cloud cuckoo land, I don't believe it. <laughs> so, so, so you're saying that uh, you, as the as the optimist, uh, that this is a bad patch in American history, but not the end of the country as we know it. So, I, I had a history professor in in high school who used to say to us. Uh, Charles McGrath was his name, he used to say, in America, third parties are like bees. Once they sting, they die. Now, there's a way in which this super populism of Trump is like a third party. It, it destroyed the old Republican mm -hmm. Party, so it's a new party. It has stung, it has not died, but, but the, I just don't believe that we're headed in a, a permanent uh, direction that, that these guys claim. I could be wrong. My children might would say, Daddy, you're, you're, you're just way too optimistic. But I do not, I don't, so I have a granddaughter who's about to turn two. I don't think she's going to live in a world as crazy as this one is. Uh, working on a new novel? I'm working on my 12th <laughs> novel. Thank you for asking. Uh, it's, Can you give us any kind of a hint? Well, so it's, the, t the, the title of this is Ooh. Phantom Orbit. And Phantom Orbit. Orbit. And it's about the intersection of espionage, which I've written about in my other novels, mm -hmm. and space. Yeah. A lot of the things that happen in the spy novel on Earth, you know, covert action, deception, counterintelligence, are all happening now up in space. And people have no idea uh, what goes on as these satellites spy on each other or the people down on the ground try to manipulate them. Are you fascinated by space? Yes. Some interesting things happening right about now, huh? Well, I, I mean, some uh, amazing things happening. The, 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 you know, the, the James Webb Telescope, I think, is mind-blowing. Yeah. The things yeah. we can see, the destruction or attempted destruction is asteroid. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, but um, I, I'll just tell you, as I wandered into this subject matter, uh, the things I have been learning about what goes on up in space that we don't know about <laughs> Uh, it just it's as a novelist, it's fun to play with. When are we going to have a book? Uh, with luck, by Christmas of next year. Okay. But it takes you know. Unfortunately, Dennis, these there's no button you can push on your computer that says you know, <laughs> yeah. do it, get it done. Gotta, it's hard work it's, to do a book. It's hard uh, work. With luck next year. I've had some fun asking this question of people that I've talked to, and it's as simple as combining a couple of thoughts. Most important lesson you've ever learned in your life. And more directly, tell me something about life that I can take from you and use in my own life. So the most important lesson, I'm going to give a two-part answer. As a journalist, the most important lesson is to um, interrogate what you think are the facts. How do you know what you think you know? And yes, somebody said it's true, but how do you know it's true? Uh, the biggest mistakes I've made as a reporter come from not asking that question. Uh -huh. So you have to, you have to, you don't just have three sources, you have to know that those three sources are right. You know, in, in, a, in a personal sense, the, I think the fundamental thing I've learned is that when I'm in a kind of no-win situation. I just can't see a way around a problem with a person or a problem with an issue. I just need to put myself in a different space uh, where the, that conflict basically dissolves and you're, you're just uh, thinking about it differently. And so I, that's probably my answer to your second question. It's for, the takeaway for, for life for me is if, I, if I'm obstructed, turn my vision 
turn my consciousness to the extent I can so I'm looking in a different direction that's open and not blocked. Beautiful answer. David, <laughs> always you. terrific you. to that's, sit down and talk yeah, with you. I agree. Thank you. Thanks so much. Our interview with David Ignatius of the Washington Post was recorded at the Venn Embassy Row Hotel in Washington. The Venn is a member of Marriott's Tribune portfolio. The first fashion gala is coming up in Washington, D.C., October 12th. For further information, go to diplomacyandfashion.com. For information about This Is America in the World, visit our YouTube channel, This Is America TV. Visit our website, thisisamerica.net, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. You can listen to all of our ambassador interviews on our podcast, The Ambassador Series. It's available on our website and iTunes. This Is America and the World is made possible by the Japan America Society of Washington, D.C. The Republic of Uzbekistan. The Sultanate of Oman. The Kingdom of Morocco. 21st Century Citizenship. The Frank Islam and Debbie Dreisman Foundation. The Forerunner Foundation, the Rotondaro Family Trust, and the Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy.